all of us want to find our calling in life. I think especially in our younger years, we spend enormous amounts of time and energy trying to find our calling, trying to fit together what we do with our sense of who we are. We hear stories of, of people for whom their work feels like play. And we are lured into pursuing that same fairy tale, assuming that that's what finding our calling must look like. Well, we are meant to find our calling, but that calling has little to do, it turns out, with our education or our job or even our marriage or our family. Our true calling is much higher than that. And only when we find it can we then live a life worthy of it. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word to us in Scripture. As always, we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would take this word this morning and plant it deeply within our hearts and cause it to grow and bear good fruit for the sake of your kingdom. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I'm reading today from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, and then verses 11 to 13. Paul said, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Again, this is the word of the Lord. So in the previous chapter, right before this passage, Paul helped his Gentile readers in the city of Ephesus discover their true calling. He told them that along with Israel, the ancient uh, people of God, these Gentiles now shared in the promise of eternal life in Christ, that, that they were now free to approach God with confidence because of Christ, and that through his spirit, Christ now lived in their hearts through faith. Paul even prayed for them. He said, I pray that you may grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Their calling, in other words, and the calling of every Christian is to know Christ and to make Christ known. No matter what choices you make, no matter what circumstances befall you, Knowing Christ and making Christ known is the highest calling that your life 
could ever have. Therefore, Paul says in our passage, as a prisoner, I urge you to live a life worthy of that calling. Paul invokes his status as a prisoner as if to say, this calling that you have to know Christ is worth being locked up for. Your calling in Christ is worth losing your safety and even your freedom. This calling to know Christ is the pearl of great price for which you would gladly sell everything else. Knowing Christ is even worth dying for, which Paul eventually did. But of course, that means that knowing Christ is also worth living. And so how do we live a life that is worthy of our calling to know Christ? Well, according to Paul, the answer is one word. Unity. Unity. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of of peace. Be humble, be gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love. Unity with one another is how we live a life worthy of our calling to know Christ and make Christ known. And we should make every effort to do so. which means not just some of the efforts, but all of them. Don't just try a few things for a little bit of unity, and then when it gets hard, give up. Don't just dabble in unity, Paul says. Make every single effort. Try all the things to achieve unity and peace with each other, and it is hard. It's not complicated but it's hard. G.K. Chesterton once wrote that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. If we're honest, which we should be, we don't always make every effort at unity. Sometimes we try a little bit, oh, well, it didn't work, and then we, we move along. We're like a character in a movie who goes up to knock on a door of somebody that they don't really want to talk to, and so they go up and they knock real fast and say, oh, gee, I guess they're not home, and then they run off as quick as they can before the person comes out. Sometimes we're a little bit like that. Oh, I tried a little bit for unity. It didn't work, so I guess, I guess we'll just do without it. No, Paul says, make every effort. Have we really made every effort? effort at unity and peace? Have we really exhausted every single option? Or are we just angry or afraid or jealous or the list goes on? Are we really holding out for unity or are we just holding on to a grudge? Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit because Christ made every effort for you. Returning that favor to others is the only worthy response. Because unity isn't just what God wants. Unity is who God is. Paul explains this rationale. He says there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. Why? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. God is one in three persons. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call this the Trinity, a combination of tri and unity. Because that's who God is. Unity is who God is, and it's the image in which we were made. Our unity and our, our need for unity flows from God's unity. See, Greek mythology got this backwards, and it's why they ended up with so many corrupt gods, right? It tried to explain the disunity that they observed among human beings by inventing gods who were as dysfunctional as we are. I mean, if we're this way, it must be because the gods are this way, right? But that's not God making us in God's image. That's us making God in our image. That's starting with us as the center of the universe, and that's never a good place to start. Instead, when we start with who God truly is, as revealed in Scripture, as revealed most of all in Jesus Christ, we discover unity. And in God's unity, we also discover our own. Unity is an inseparable part of our calling to know Christ and to make Christ known. That being said, unity is not uniformity, is it? On the contrary, it relies on the coordination of the diverse gifts of grace that Christ has. Has given us. Paul said to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Friends, diversity is a wonderful gift from God. Diversity of skin and language and thought and perspective and yes, even politics is God's gracious gift to us. A gift without which we can never be united. We can be uniform Without diversity, we can be the same, but we can't be one. And there's a difference. If we're serious about unity, we must also be serious about diversity. We must make room for the other, for the different, for that which threatens our comfort and our certainty and our sameness. Because when we do, we will find ourselves in the company of none other than Jesus Christ himself. Later in the service, we will ordain and install some of you as elders and deacons in the church. This church has called you because it has discerned your diverse gifts in Jesus Christ. We've called you not to be like the person next to you, but to use the gifts given to you to build up this body, this church, and equip us for works of service. There's a great story about a rabbi named Zeusia who said, in the coming world, they will not ask me, why were you not Moses? They will ask me, why were you not Zeusia? This church needs you to be you, not someone else. And and not just for the sake of your own authenticity, but for the sake of our unity. We will fall apart without you. Today, 
when all of you go home, you can tell your friends and family that you finally found your calling. It is to know Christ, and it is to make Christ known. And friends, we can only be worthy of it together. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.